Now for today's program. Today's Zoominar is part of the Wide River Project, a joint initiative of Western State Center and Moment Magazine that takes a deep dive and fresh look into the art, history, and issues that both unite and divide the Black and Jewish communities. Clarence Page is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist at the Chicago Tribune's Washington Bureau, where he is a syndicated columnist and member of the editorial board since 1984. He has also worked as an on-air reporter at Chicago's CBS affiliate WBBM-TV. His articles have appeared in the New Republic, the Wall Street Journal, and Chicago Magazine, among many others. And he has served as news commentator on programs such as Black Entertainment Television's Lead Story, ABC's This Week, and NPR's Weekend Sunday. Clarence has also hosted several PBS documentaries. In addition to winning the Pulitzer Prize for Commentary, he received an Illinois UPI Award for an investigative series titled The Black Tax. Clarence is the author of Showing My Color, Impolite Essays on Race and Identity. Nadine Epstein, an award-winning journalist and writer, has been the editor-in-chief and CEO of Moment Magazine since 2004 and is the founder and executive director of the Center for Creative Change. As a young reporter in Chicago, she covered the city's impoverished South Side and public housing projects, as well as Mayor Harold Washington, Chicago's first Black mayor, the Reverend Jesse L. Jackson Sr., and the Nation of Islam. Nadine's latest book is RBG's Brave and Brilliant Women, 33 Jewish Women to Inspire Everyone, which she wrote in collaboration with the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Eric K. Ward is a nationally recognized expert on the relationship between authoritarian movements, hate violence, and preserving inclusive democracy. Throughout his career, Eric has worked with community groups, government and business leaders, human rights advocates, and philanthropy. He currently serves as executive director of Western State Center, is senior fellow with the Southern Poverty Law Center and Race Forward, and chair of the Proteus Fund. Eric is the recipient of the 2021 Civil Courage Prize. Please welcome Clarence Page, Nadine Epstein, and Eric K. Ward. Eric and I are so delighted to host Clarence today. I just have to tell everybody, I've known Clarence since I was a cub reporter at the City News Bureau of Chicago, which was a wire service, a notorious wire service boot camp for journalists that was owned by the Chicago Tribune and the Chicago Sun-Times. And Clarence was at the Tribune, and he was a wise and generous friend and um, I always loved talking to him. And um, of course, I was busy running around in my little car covering, you know, whatever was happening in town. And I would often run into Clarence and he was writing about these same topics, but with a lot greater experience at the time. So I'm so happy to have you here. And um, and Eric, would you, I think Eric's very happy to have you here too. Eric, would you like to I am. Greet, I'm, greet uh, <laughs> I'm sitting here. Look, uh, Nadine, it's great. It's great to see you. And uh, it's great to be back. And I'm being very quiet because I'm just sitting here thinking, uh, here I am uh, in conversation with Clarence Page, who has had such an amazing influence um, uh, you know, really the, the writer and columnist uh, from an early age, it's for, where I first learned about apartheid, was from uh, Clarence Page's writings when, when I was young. Uh, um, uh, the McLaughlin group, right, was uh, well watched by, by uh, uh, my dad. It was really the, the voice of our generation. And I'm excited because Clarence Page uh, informed me at times, frustrated me at times. I wanted him to take harder stances, but he was always very thoughtful and his own voice and, and his own morals uh, helped me understand the world in more nuanced and, and complex ways. And uh, it's an honor. So you should all know, everyone listening, Clarence, uh, Nadine, even as I'm asking questions, what I'm really sitting here thinking is, here I am sitting with uh, Clarence Page. What, what an honor. So I'm going to be quiet. Now, and I'm going to turn it back over to, to you, Nadine, but Clarence, it, it is a pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to be with you all, and you, you, you're just buttering me up so much. I, I'm going to wait for you to come in for the kill. Here now. <laughs> <laughs> there will be I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm no killing to, here. <laughs> you, would not believe, you would not believe how many people have told me, I used to watch your show every week because my dad made me watch it. That's <laughs> right. My father was always watching it. I couldn't talk to him unless I watched the show. This kind of thing. I mean, it, it, it's really uh, very uh, interesting and illuminating for me. And it's also very humbling. And Eric, I want to tell you, it's not that easy for me to be humble, but I have learned 
<laughs> I learned what it's like. <laughs> It's, um, such, it's, it's, uh, it's so wonderful. And I can't wait. My father uh, turns 97 in October. And uh, when I Give speak, him my best. I will. I, I will absolutely uh, uh, do that. I cannot wait uh, to tell him about today's event. That's great. Well, let me start a little bit. And I just want to take a pause and I want to talk a minute about Chicago because all three of us have lived in Chicago. And um, Chicago really had, and we're not going to be only focused on Chicago today, but, you know, in many ways, Chicago, it doesn't get the kind of credit it deserves in, I think, discussions about the good credit and maybe some of the bad credit in about discussions about Black Jewish alliance. And I think that in many ways, Chicago was kind of a pioneer of some of these alliances. And I was just going to, I was just showing this earlier that we actually did in 2009, this is in celebration, marking the inauguration of our first black president in the United States. Um, we did a whole program, which was, well, it looked like at the time, blacks and Jews come full circle. It was a photo essay that it looked, that covered 1909 to 2009. And it actually revealed some of these partnership waves. Like the first photo was of Rabbi Emil Hirsch, who was a founder of NAACP who ran Chicago's Sinai, Sinai Congregation. He lived from 1880 to 1923. And he was, he influenced Julius Rosenwald, who I'm gonna ask Clarence just a tiny bit about because we have a whole program coming up on him. And then there are also photos of Rabbi Arnold Wolf, who my friend uh, Lisa Newman's parents introduced me to when he was at KM Isaiah Israel. And I didn't even know at the time that he'd been a secretary to Abraham Joshua Heschel. He'd marched in Selma. He'd actually got, been uh, in trouble with the FBI for bringing Martin Luther King and also some of the defendants in the Chicago 7 conspiracy theory trial to come and to, to speak at his uh, other synagogue that he was at. I met Jane Ramsey, who was part of this Jewish Council on Urban Affairs, which is very active in, in Chicago, who was then part of Mayor Har Harold Washington's um, cabinet. And the other thing that was so interesting um, is that really there were a number of Jews who were so instrumental in bringing Obama to the attention and supporting, originally like even like discovering him and supporting his campaigns, people such as Betty Lou Saltzman, who introduced him to David, Ax David Axelrod, who I believe interned with Clarence at one yes. time. Yes, <laughs> at the Tribune, <laughs> and, way back when. Uh, and then the late, and then of course the late Judge Abner Mikva. So I just want to, you know, I thought we'd just start with Rosenwald. I know again we have another program, but just uh, tell us a little bit about kind of the historic alliance of Blacks and Jews in Chicago. Yeah, I wish. I, well, I, I I definitely want to see your program on Rosenwald. I learned about Rosenwald much too late, but better late than never. Uh, and, and, and how much my life and my family's lives uh, were, were tied to him. And, and my wife grew up in Hyde Park uh, there, which uh, got a Museum of Science and Industry right there, which wouldn't be there if it wasn't for Julius Rosenwald. There's so much that man did uh, for, for public, public housing in Chicago, but the Rosenwald schools are what really impresses me. And, and everybody ought, ought to know about that story because there were about, we, you, you know, after uh, Reconstruction uh, in the South, uh, schools are still segregated, and uh, uh, the southern states weren't funding uh, uh, these schools worth a darn. And Julius Rosenwald uh, got together with Booker T. Washington. They had a great alliance, uh, which um, is underpublicized. But um, the, the idea was uh, Rosenwald, uh, Rosenwald uh, said, no, how, how much uh, would it cost to just build uh, a thousand schools? And uh, Washington said, well, I don't know if we can find out, but but I, I don't want you to build the schools. If you, if you give us half the funding, we'll take care of the rest and build twice as many schools. And and also uh, employ uh, young black folks to be carpenters and masons and plumbers, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, to, to uh, make these schools work. And uh, the, the, the Rosenwald School was invented. And we called it the Rosenwald School, but Julius Rosenwald didn't like to publicize himself. Yeah. Otherwise, Museum of Science and Industry would be called the Rosenwald Museum. A lot, a lot of the stuff that, that he funded uh, would, would have that title. Uh, but 
uh, he um, did, uh, I understand, 5,000 schools. And you can uh, talk about we're this. Gonna talk, we're going to talk more about that in this other program. Yeah. But, I, but also just Emil Hirsch was the rabbi who basically suggested and influenced him to do that. And these yeah. are all Chicagoans, you know, Sears Rabbi who started in Chicago. This is like, this is sort of setting the stage for what's happening later. That's right. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to just insert the, the Rosenwald documentary. Uh, the, the woman who made that. Uh, she, Aviva uh, she, Kempner. I'm sorry. Yes, Aviva uh, Kempner. Uh, uh, Aviva Kempner. Thank you. Uh, Aviva uh, asked me, by the way, did you go to a Rosenwald school? And I said, no, they were mostly down south. You know, no, I, I'm part of the family that, that went north. Uh, but um, I'll, I'll talk to my, my uh, relatives. Next time I talked to my, my cousin, Willie, who I grew up with, he was the closest cousin, and uh, we were talking, and I said, by the way, uh, have you heard of the Rosenwald schools? And he said, oh, yeah, we all went to Rosenwald schools. <laughs> now, yeah. I didn't know this, you know, but uh, this is just one of those bits of black history. Uh, now they're making, they're making it against the law to study black history, so I guess we're just going to have to keep on pushing. Well, well we're going to have to talk about that, too. Um, yeah. So... So by the way, so Claire's gave me a whole lot of notes of things that he'd love to cover today. And so we're going to try to cover a few of these. But and 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 Eric, break in at any time you want. But, I will, I promise. So, you know, one of the things you start you mentioned is that I thought maybe you could give us a little view of some of the most pivotal points of the shared history from the beginning of the 20th century. And and maybe you want to. And I, and I noticed when you put your notes together that you started with maybe the most, one of the most positive ones, which was the civil rights, um, civil rights era. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about that or just give us some idea of your pivotal points? I'm sorry, we talk, talk to, to me or to Eric? Oh, I'm talking to you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, my pivotal point. Well, uh, frankly, uh, Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney, uh, uh, this is strictly personal, but uh, I was a, a junior in high school when the Freedom Riders uh, got together at Western College for training uh, and, and then went down south to register people to vote. And um, I, my, uh, uh, the local NAACP chairman, I'm making a short story long, I'm sorry, I'll try not to, but, but uh, the local NAACP asked for people who, who had uh, spare rooms to volunteer to, to put up these trainees. And so we, we had a whole family staying with us at our house for a couple of weeks while they were trained to go down south. And after, the, after they did go down south, I don't know, a, a week or so passed before we got the, the news about Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney. Now, anybody who was watching TV in the early 60s saw the news, the big headline, three civil rights workers uh, did it disappear uh, in the South. Uh, and um, uh, you, had, you had two Jewish uh, fellows, uh, Goodman and Schwerner, and, and, and uh, James Cheney was the black uh, youth who was working with them, uh, and he was a Mississippian. And uh, J. Edgar Hoover uh, was trying to convince LBJ that, that this was all a, a plot, that those, those boys were fine. It was just, uh, there was just a bunch of communists trying to, trying to scare everybody, blah, blah, blah. It was, it was really a, a remarkable summer. They finally found the bodies in August, as, as I recall. Uh, but the great sacrifice that these young people made and the uh, great partnership th that they had, most of the white folks working with the movement uh, in the center, most of the volunteers uh, were Jewish. Uh, something like a, about two-thirds of the, the civil rights um, uh, movements, funds, uh, SCLC, uh, came from Jewish donors in the North. Uh, and I mean, uh, you just go uh, on and on. The Rabbi Heschel, I just, I, I used to wonder watching Martin Luther King March, who is that, the, the, that guy with the, with the beard next to him? It was Rabbi Heschel. And he was, uh, he and Martin Luther King had um, uh, the closest partnership, one can imagine. And, and it was very uh, effective because the two of them thought alike in so many ways. They appreciated what uh, both black and Jewish uh, history had in common, how much uh, of the religious tradition uh, of, of each had been shared. Uh, you know, we grew up, we black folks grew up uh, 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 learning and, and singing the Old Testament more than the New Testament because all the imagery of, of Pharaoh and the children of Israel in bondage and, and uh, um, uh, 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 crossing over the River Jordan uh, to freedom. Uh, and the prophets. Uh, all all and those the gospel prophets. songs. Yeah. I'm sorry? 
the profits yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I, I love reading uh, Heschel's speeches now uh, and, uh, and reading ne next to King's speeches because the two of them did think so much alike and they were so much so important as spiritual leaders that we need more like them today. Actually, we have a great story about that in a moment. We just did a whole profile on Susanna Heschel, and she talks a lot about this, which we'll mm -hmm. share with everybody. I have a quick question. I know Eric's going to pop in in a second. So you lived in Middletown, Ohio, and when you had this family come to stay with you, or these, these civil rights workers come to stay with you, were some of them Jewish? Uh, no, these were uh, black workers from the South. Okay. And, uh, there, there may have been uh, some, uh, well, I, kn I know there were, there were, uh, 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 Jews at Western College as well, because uh, I know uh, uh, Michael Schmerer, one, one of those who was killed, was Jewish from Long, Long Island, as I recall. And I, I'm embarrassed. Now, I, I interviewed his wife about 20 years ago, and, and, and she's carrying on uh, his work and, and his name uh, beautifully. Uh, all the families of, of these three are. Uh, but um, yeah, that was the old Western College for Women. Uh, uh, for, for young people, now it's better known today as the Western Campus of Miami University. It was right across the street. And um, uh, uh, but, but, uh, well, uh, uh, now it's called, it's called the Western Campus. Everybody wonders why, because it's on the east side of the university. It was because of the, of, of the old name of, of, of the old school of, was a private sister of Antioch College. And uh, yeah, I grew up about 15 minutes from there. So uh, that was just one of many remarkable brushes with history that I've had in my life. Wow. Eric, Eric, did you want to pop in? Yeah. So, so Clarence, you, tell us a, a little bit from, from your experience. So, you know, we, we hear of, of the Black Jewish relationship in the midst of the Civil Rights Coalition. We, we understand, of course, it didn't represent the entire communities, right? This was uh, a coalition of civil rights advocates from both of those communities. Uh, but sure. we've seen in significant ways in, in the ways that you just talked about. I know also in Mississippi, a significant percentage of the of the legal support there uh, uh, were Jewish, right? Were Jewish who were invested in the success of the civil rights movement. As you're growing up in Ohio, as, you, as you're going to, to um, as you're becoming a journalist, are is this surprising that this coalition is kind of formulating? Are there signs before of this relationship? Uh, what? How, how are we to understand the significance of it in that moment? Yeah, you know, uh, this is something that uh, I always try to separate myself, my personal experience from what was, what was everybody else experiencing. I have to say that I feel very fortunate that I grew up in Middletown, Ohio, uh, which also fills me who read Hillbilly Elegy, the same town, only I'm 30 years older than, uh, almost 30 years older than J.D. Vance. We can talk about that if you want to as well, because uh, that book taught me a lot about uh, how similar the lives of blacks and whites are in, in these uh, troubled factory towns in Ohio. Uh, and that uh, sometimes we, we talk too much about race, focus too, too much on that. We always focus, focus more on class, but that's another, uh, maybe we can do, do another program on that. But anyway, uh, I, I grew up with um, a, a pretty mixed bunch of, of kids around me. There were plenty of jobs in Middletown in those days. It's a steel mill town and, and uh, all the uh, other factories around. And I belong to some uh, social civic groups for kids, uh, uh, one of them in, in particular, uh, which enabled us to go on field trips around uh, the town. And uh, I had a couple of Jewish friends in high school. Uh, uh, we, we went to their temple uh, and we went to well, everybody's church and temple we went to uh, back then. That was a valuable experience for me. I, I just really got to know, know not only people uh, of different ethnicities, but also uh, something about their culture. And that came in so handy when I became a reporter in Chicago, as Nadine can tell you, <laughs> because Chicago is a patchwork of ethnic neighborhoods. And it's important for us all to know uh, uh, not just uh, how different we are, but how similar we are. And so I, I, I really, um, it, it didn't strike me as that I, I was pleasantly surprised to see the heavy involvement of Jews in the civil rights movement. It didn't really surprise me a whole heck of a lot, though, because like I say, Rabbi Heschel sounded just like Martin Luther King when you listen to him talk. It was very stirring and very inspirational. And uh, there was a sense of partnership that people had. Uh, and coming from a small town where everybody knows everybody, you kind of size people up pretty quickly. You know, is this person on your side or not? And uh, so I, I think um, 
at that time, it was uh, very refreshing and rewarding and very encouraging. And I think a lot, I'm not alone here. I mean, people across America, you watch that footage of, of the marchers coming across the uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge there in Selma. And you see right up there in front, Dr. King and then Rabbi Heschel and all, all these other folks. There's a Greek Orthodox bishop there and, and others. I don't see how anybody can watch that without being in some way moved and inspired by how people are going out of their way and literally risking, risking their lives for human rights to fight in the last battle of the Civil War. Uh, that was uh, was very inspirational to me. But I when, I when I went to college to Ohio University, the Berkeley of the Backwoods, as we call it, I, had, I met even more kids from the East and, and uh, kids, you know, big city youngsters and, and this sort of thing. I will never forget one girlfriend of mine, I mean, she was she was a girl who was a friend <laughs> and she, uh, part, of, part of this cafeteria dining group of ours. And uh, I remember uh, when I or anybody else asked her, what would you like to do? She's full of ideals. And, and I said, what is, your, what is your goal? And she said, I want to go down south and educate the adult Negro. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what I look like. Yeah, I said, uh-uh. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> I mean, that's can, can, can you believe that, Nadine? I mean, I mean, we know people like this, don't we? They they mm -hmm. are so idealistic. Uh, they're they're all virtually in a, in a dream world and can't wait to go out there and, and meet the real world. And uh, I always have, I, I've spent now fifty years uh, wanting to uh, know what happened to her because uh, she was she was smart. She was going to be a teacher and she could have done a lot of good work. But I'd like to know what what. Uh, how her attitudes are, because I've, I've um, read and, and met so many people who went off to, into the world with those kind of attitudes, kind of dreamy, and they <laughs> they came into reality just as, as I did in, in, in many ways about different people. Uh, one thing I had to learn, I, I was such an idealist in my young days, I thought everybody was just begging to have peace on earth and goodwill and, and just get together if, if only the uh, either the bad people or the shackles of uh, of cultural blindness because just if we put it aside we can all join hands and uh sing uh or whatever and I, I, uh... <laughs> we shall overcome or whatever uh but uh, as you know the world's more complicated than that but it, it's good that young people get to know something outside of their own home their own home community uh to to really appreciate the diversity we have in this country well, we're going to talk about what young people we might want to teach to new generations in a minute, but I wanted to switch us over to some of the tensions. So, you know, there's this very idealistic moment, you know, there's this coming together. And I just want to say that there are people here today who I know are on who were among the first donors to Martin Luther King Jr. or who's uh, a friend whose uncle was Morris Abram, who was, you know, fighting for, as a, was a lawyer fighting for justice. There are a, a lot of the people who have joined us today really care. Uh, I just saw him last um, week, <laughs> Morris Abrams. You did? Um, so there's tensions. So, um, so there were a lot of tensions, though, that came around, like, you know, 1967. 1967, there's a war in Israel, the 1967 war. Uh, that has some impact. There is the very kind of notorious breakup within SNCC, which is the student, like the student group, which, so maybe just um, tell us a little tiny bit about this sort of uh, moment where, not that, of course, many, many people maintain their idealism. This is, we're talking, you know, there's this um, kind of, you know, there, but there are breakups occurring. There are tensions occurring. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Tell us a and, little. Uh, and it, it's inevitable. I, Call it, and I didn't invent this phrase, but uh, uh, our relationship has been like a troubled marriage. Uh, blacks and Jews have found themselves working together or living together, uh, partly because of housing segregation, you know, mutual victims of, of discrimination or whatever. Uh, and uh, also uh, find ourselves working together for, for mutual advantage uh, and uh, uh, pushing for progress. Uh, and uh, these periods are separated by uh, great frictions and, and points of tension. Uh, there was a, and I, I remember we, we just brought up a student nonviolent coordinating committee and um, what, what I call the, the, the day the black folks kicked the white folks out of the civil rights movement, uh, not, not the whole movement, but out of SNCC, which was the younger, uh, more militant oriented, uh, famous for H. Rap Brown and Sophie Carmichael or, 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 or Kwame Turi, as he later uh, renamed himself. And, uh, the um, 
uh, level of, well, the Black Power uh, movement arose in 66, which, which I call uh, a, um, uh, a, a movement in search of a, well, I'm sorry, a slogan in search of a program because there was never really an agenda of, of Black Power. That's, that's why people were writing books and making speeches to try to explain what it was. Everybody had a different concept of it. It's a lot like a Black Lives Matter today, uh, but it was, it was strong, it was powerful. And unlike Black Lives Matter, you had a lot of, of, um, of, of uh, I just call it cultural and ethnic envy of all the Jews that were influential inside of the movement. Uh, the, uh, the, the young, more militant Blacks wanted to get uh, wanted to purify the ranks and um, uh, be, uh, you know, of, by, and for Black people, et cetera, et cetera. And so that was a, a big thing. And, and this is right after, I mean, really, we're talking here, here uh, uh, Goodman, Schwerner, and Chang were killed in 64. And then, like, by 66, suddenly you get this, this kind of friction pop up. And, and this uh, ha has happened repeatedly, uh, most notably with Louis Farrakhan and after Jesse Jackson uh, was uh, running for the nomination back in 84. And um, uh, made some very imprudent, to say the least, well, really downright uh, racist statements. Although he, he, he claims he was misinterpreted, nevertheless, um, that was another time of tension. By now, I'm a columnist, and so I'm out writing about this sort of thing and, and uh, talking to. Uh, I interviewed Farrakhan. I, uh, of course, been interviewing Jesse Jackson since I got into journalism back in '69, uh, and. Um, there are, um, he says, I'm, I'm probably the oldest living <laughs> reporter, or, or I've, been, I've been reporting him the longest of any living reporter, put it that way. But anyway, uh, it, it's a, um, uh, the, the, the kind of tension has uh, occurred repeatedly, but I think a lot of it is because, well, the, the marriage companion is, uh, excuse, excuse me, the marriage comparison is good, I think, because uh, it, like in a marriage, um, you start off, uh, things are going great. You've got all, all kinds of ideals. You're working together and um, you've got a great partnership. But at some point, you've got to have some friction because somebody takes the other one for granted. And when that happens, then you can have a, one of those, uh, 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 you know, deals where, where the, the wife comes in and the husband's watching the Super Bowl says, you don't love me anymore. He says, yes, of course I do. Now, please wait till halftime. You know, I mean, uh, uh, the races or, or ethnic tribes can be that same kind of way. And well, this happens with us. I think it's happening now. I, I think it kind of happened with the, uh, the, the Obama campaign was, was a very successful rejoining of, uh, of, of people from different backgrounds uh, quite happily. I, I'm not just talking about blacks and Jews here, but, but the, the heavy Hyde Park roots of that in Chicago <laughs> gave it certainly that type of a, uh, of, of, a, of a cast. But there is that now, uh, we're learning, as I suspected, we're learning a lot more about uh, what people uh, carry around in, in their heads about, uh, uh, well, feeling threatened by other groups and uh, taking other groups for granted. Uh, and, and this is uh, something that wasn't really obvious when Barack Obama was elected because there was so much joy in the air. Uh, but over time now, we've seen that the old fissures were still there. And then, of course, comes Donald Trump, who also noticed those fissures and has done all he can to make them even wider. Uh, and so now uh, we wonder, uh, where do we go from here, as Dr. King said uh, back uh, before he passed? Uh, we have that kind of a question to ask. And I think my feeling um, is still the ideal is that we can learn so much from the experience of, of Blacks and Jews, in particular, how well these two groups worked together in the past uh, to see uh, what went right, what went wrong, and, and how we can uh, work together in this increasingly pluralistic society. Clarence, let's, let's stay here for a second, if, if we can. Yeah. Um, help us understand, just from, from your perspective, or, 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 you know, at least tell us a few things that we might understand about that period. So we understand the tension between uh, Blacks and Jews, or at least we believe we do, and we're often told that that tension was a Southern tension, but uh, um, was it more of a Northern tension? Were those primarily the Northern civil rights leadership? And was that based off the relationships that were happening within kind of Northern communities between Blacks and Jews? So how might we understand that? What was this, this tension? Because as you said, 
it wasn't really a black and white tension within the civil rights movement. It sounds like when black folks were saying whites go home, they were really saying, uh, which was the probably the majority of white presenting were actually Jews. So in right. some ways, were they telling Jews to go home? How are we to understand kind of the, well, the nuances? We do have to, yes, the, uh, the, the white folks involved in the movement were disproportionately Jewish, but we cannot give short shrift to all, all the Irish Catholics who were in the yeah. movement and, and, and martyred in some cases. There was a that, that wonderful uh, woman from the Italian family in uh, Bella Liuzzo, I believe her name was, as I recall, from, from Detroit, uh, who uh, was so moved by the movement that she got to get up and volunteered and went down south and, and was, was was murdered by Klansmen. Uh, uh, down there, uh, another casualty of the movement. And there was a Father Grappi, I remember, uh, at, in Milwaukee, and there were various others. Um, and uh, so there was a disproportionate number of Irish Catholics involved in the movement, too, in other words. And you, you can go on, there, there were many Protestants who were uh, involved as well. But I think just the disproportional um, um, presence of, of Jews, as well as the similarities uh, of us as ethnic uh, minorities in America. I remember back in 19, it was, it was about 1980, um, the Chicago Reporter, a well-known investigative uh, newsletter in Chicago, the Community Renewal Society puts it out, and they do investigative journalism, very good uh, publication, and, and it's all about race relations and ethnic relations. And uh, they uh, uh, reported the story that for the first time, there were more uh, Jews living in the Chicago suburbs than in the city. Uh, that was the first part of that story. The second part was that uh, this they were the last white ethnic group to leave the city in, in that sense. You know how ethnic succession works. The immigrant group comes in, it's formed a neighborhood, and then they, uh, uh, as they become more prosperous, they move more and more toward the suburbs and, and out. The Jews were the last to leave Chicago, basically what it boils down to. You know, the, some of the names that, that Nadine was mentioning before, Abner Mikva and various others. Uh, and they Hyde. never left. A lot of those never left. They were in Hyde Park. They were in, yeah. uh, they stayed in North, right, North Chicago. So there yeah. were many neighborhoods that did have, were, were remained integrated, even South Shore till very late in the game. Uh, you know, I was just thinking Jews. of what, I was thinking of what a lot of my Hyde Park friends call, called the, the uh, Mikva Exodus. Uh, that occurred back when, when Mikva moved to Evanston, as I recall. Uh, a whole lot of other folks in Hyde Park moved to Evanston, too. It was just, uh, uh, I mean, you have to ask them why they all did, but there was that sense of... A lot of them stayed. Point. There were a lot of Jews who stayed in Hyde Park. Hyde Park is its own world. That's I know. I married a Hyde Parker, remember? <laughs> yeah, I was a Hyde Parker, so... I'm learning this all the time. <laughs> they use South Siders. Right, Southsiders. Uh, yeah. Southsiders. Well, no, not to disparage folks on the South Side. But there's a very yeah. interesting phenomena that's occurring on the South Side of Chicago, which is a phenomena that's not coming from the South. And let's talk a little bit about Nation of Islam and Louis Farrakhan, because right. um, we both covered him. Um, you can't help it if you're in Chicago. We both saw that you know the Nation of Islam in an era where you know there's a lot of poverty in projects and in black neighborhoods, Nation of Islam was out there doing the good work. They were out there, you know, organizing people. They were out there providing food. They were out there providing meaning. And it, it wasn't even necessarily a religious component. I mean, they were providing that as well. But this is kind of the, this sort of, this sort of black religious right that kind of ends up settling in the south side of Chicago. And yeah. that we're still dealing with today in all sorts of ways. So tell us a little bit about this stream uh, from the north and 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 how today this remains incredibly relevant, even though you know you would imagine it's a very small, it is a very small group of people. And people always say, Oh, Louis Farrakhan, he's old, he's out, you know what? He's really his 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 brand of anti-Semitism is usually is usually effective today. So tell us a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, well, first of all, uh, yeah, they, uh, they have been around for a long time. And for further details, uh, read the autobiography of Malcolm X or any other uh, book about the Muslims. They go back to the 1930s in Detroit. And they were, they were primarily a Detroit-based uh, organization or a, a religious sect. 
uh, uh, that um, uh, over, over time, uh, with various individuals migrated to Chicago because uh, Elijah Muhammad came to Chicago. And then uh, after he uh, passed, uh, well, even before he passed, uh, Louis Farrakhan came to Chicago and uh, was put over on, on the west side. This was uh, after uh, 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 Elijah Muhammad uh, died. Uh, his son, Wallace Muhammad, uh, was given the task of taking over the nation. But Wallace is a uh, Orthodox Muslim. Uh, he was mentored by Malcolm X, and Malcolm X went over to Orthodox Islam, and, and Wallace went with him. Uh, last time I went to, to Wallace's, or I should say, Warif Dean Muhammad is his name now. Uh, last time I went to, to uh, his uh, a, a, a mosque, he was, uh, well, the uh, congregation was all, uh, well, I'd say at least half Arab uh, and, and, and Middle Eastern Muslims. Uh, and so it looks like virtually any other um, and he's a, uh, and he's mosque. And he's a kind of relative moderate compared to Farrakhan, right? So. Well, well, yeah, well he, he, yeah, he's not political at all. Yeah. He's uh, very, very spiritual, just like Malcolm became very spiritual in the end. But I, I, I digress. There's so, so much to hit here. Uh, when when uh, Warith Dean Muhammad uh, left, ortho, left the uh, Nation of Islam and uh, turned to orthodoxy, uh, Louis Farrakhan was assigned to a, a masjid or mosque on the west side of Chicago, really so that <laughs> Wal Wal Walrif could keep an eye on him. But he just broke away right about the time that uh, Jesse Jackson was getting, getting heat. Uh, and um, uh, he started making headlines by doing things like referring to Judaism as, as a dirty religion. Uh, it was controversial that he said, uh, he was quoted saying gutter religion. And he said, well, I didn't say gutter, I said dirty. Get it straight, will you? I mean, this is the kind of thing that happens. How do, how do you report this? You know, because he was, he, he was making this long point, uh, but he went and uh, he used inflammatory language to make his point. And so... I, from the White Folks Chicago Tribune, report on this, uh, and then um, uh, people get angry, and, and then uh, Black folks say, well, you're misinterpreting him, and you just, <laughs> you're playing the white man's game. It can be tricky covering somebody like this, so uh, Farrakhan helped me to become ready for covering Donald Trump, because the same thing happens now in reverse, you could say, uh, with uh, white folks saying, you're misinterpreting him, et cetera, et cetera. But the, Even if you didn't uh, misinterpret him, by the way, like I did a big sorry? story. I did a big story. I, I broke this story where he got $5 million from Gaddafi to yeah, invest we'll get in to that. black empowerment in Chicago. And he created, really, I mean, his, his people created all these really great programs. And I wrote a really, po I mean, it was really a pretty positive story yeah. about it. all these great programs, except there was one part that it was financed by a loan from Gaddafi. And, you right. know, it was, and, um, and, and, and I wrote this story. I never even, I, to be honest, when I, I never crossed my mind that I was Jewish when I wrote this story. But after I wrote this story, I suddenly, there was a story in the Chicago Reader, which was like their, their village voice, um, that meant how I was Jewish and I had written the stories if I had had some agenda, but I had actually written this fairly pretty positive story about, you know, this was a way of battling poverty. And it was part of this whole idea, like blacks empowering blacks and building an economic world, which was partially, you know, part of the, the Farrakhan, the Nation of Islam philosophy. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, it was very hard to cover uh, whether you were white or black was very hard to cover Farrakhan. But anyway, yeah, but, so go but, ahead. So well, those kind of positive programs have always been there. The nation yeah. of Islam was always a, a, an, an empire to self-help, just like Booker T. Washington, only more religious and with all of the uh, uh, arraignment that goes with that. Uh, but he um, uh, was, was always creating jobs. Uh, they opened beautiful restaurants that uh, uh, served uh, uh, delicious uh, kosher meals. They, they didn't call them kosher. They were halal, uh, halal, halal. Uh, thank you, halal. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, they, uh, but, but very enterprising. I, and I've, got, I've got a cousin, by the way, a, a Detroit cousin, Faith. Um, I keep forgetting her her Muslim name, but um, uh, she, and, she and her husband, uh, both black Muslims, as, as the press used to call them, uh, and they, they make the bean pies and the other uh, products and, and sell them, uh, and, and they've got six kids, and well, their kids are grand, grandparents now, but anyway, I'm old, yeah, but anyway, 
they uh, so I've always ha had Muslims in the family. Uh, if you were black in, in urban America, uh, Muslims came to your door every, every week uh, selling Muhammad speaks or selling fish or selling the bean pies. Uh, they've always been, been part of the uh, one of my one of my sarcastic buddies she used to say assalamu alaikum no ham cheese or bacon but that was that was the kind of uh, mockery some of the kids would have about the muslims but also everybody respected the muslims though and, and that was important and, and that's the kind of um goodwill that, that farcon brought with them and used that uh to to gain uh, some credibility and so, that goodwill is still there and that's one thing i want to talk about because yeah. you know we in dc right now you know we have uh, one of our, we have someone running for mayor who, who, who many years ago already, uh, we just did a kind of a deep dive into this, you know, made some anti-Semitic statements where he blamed the weather on the Rothschilds. Um, that, mm -hmm. you know, made it, it made, it, I happened to be at that day when that happened, I we happened to be in Israel, actually, maybe that's where I first met Eric. And um, you know, every, all, all everybody could talk about was this city council member in D.C. had just blamed the weather on the Rothschilds because um, there had been like some freak, freak snowstorm. But, mm -hmm. you know, he and there are many people like him get a lot of this kind of thinking from the nation of Islam, even though they may or not be direct members. But these are this is it's 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 a has a lot of influence in some parts again, I want to say some parts of the African-American community. And right. it has staying power. And I think this staying power comes from its, um, these economic projects. Um, and from that respect, um, I don't know what you think about that. What do you both, got, what do you both think about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's yeah, oh, it. I, I'm so not cutting off Clarence Page. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't mind me. I've known Maybe Clarence sure. for a I'll while. Talk all day. But, uh, Clarence gave me I, permission to cut him off ahead of time. Clarence, you go first. Okay, well, since so, so, so you're so curious uh, so, so to say that, I, I just want to say that um, the, uh, where do I begin? Uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, this is the paranoid style of American politics. Again, here, uh, this is how the Trump era has helped me to educate myself a lot of mysteries of life. Like, why do people believe paranoid conspiracy theories? Uh, you're right, but it didn't start with Farrakhan. Uh, the Muslims have always uh, had um, uh, some paranoid theories. Uh, there's, there's always been a touch of QAnon in, in the Nation of Islam. Uh, and uh, I, I can say that freely because the Nation of Islam is virtually defunct now compared to Orthodox Islam. Uh, but but the, the Nation always had a certain element of uh, uh, paranoid uh, uh, politics. And, and the Rothschilds, that's the standard trope that you hear in paranoid circles for, for who's causing everything bad in the world, right? Uh, and not just the Rothschilds, a whole bunch of different conspiracy theories. And now we got QAnon coming out with a new theory per week or whatever. And they've also got the internet to inflame and to spread their uh, bad words, uh, their, their um, um, mythology. Uh, and that um, add, adds a new element to it. Uh, there's actually more co competition for Farrakhan now uh, on that score. But back to your point, uh, Nadine, when I look at what, and I haven't visited them lately, but when I look at, at what the fruit of Islam, which is the male, uh, uh, really uh, the soldier wing, as many call it, they're not armed, and that's the beauty of it. They they work at, at housing projects with, with uh, severe gang problems, and they have brought peace and tranquility uh, to these developments. And I, I know several here in D.C. that for years have had uh, the fruit of Islam patrolling. There were several in Chicago. Now, I have not caught up with this story lately, but I, I was covering that story for years. And I said, you know, you know, here's a community where the police aren't enough to bring peace or they aren't trusted. But here are these unarmed brothers in bow ties out here keeping the streets peaceful and, and providing a sense of security for the families out there. To me, that's the best thing uh, in, in these troubled times that the Nation of Islam does. But again, they are really an extension of what I call the, the uh, Marcus Garvey, Booker T. Washington uh, end or wing of black leadership. There's always been the self-help wing, uh, which said we need to do for ourselves. And the other wing, like Du Bois and many others who said that we need to uh, reach out and uh, 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 we, well, we need to, to, to reach out and 
overcome the oppression and the institutional racism that is holding us back. And the fact is, we as African Americans need both. And, and we have turned to both at different times in order to try to, to make some advancement. Uh, so that's why the Muslims are so well liked and often loved in the black community. It, it is that even among people who still, you know, like like my, my mother always uh, thought they were just a little too strange. And, and my mother and grandmother, the ladies in my family, very Baptist, you know, they want anybody that wasn't Baptist, they were suspicious about what you were all about. But, and, and they also didn't like fish. Uh, but, <laughs> but beyond that, they had to respect these nice, clean, well-dressed um, men in bow ties. And they turned to me and say, why, why can't you dress like that? You be, <laughs> you know, uh, that the, 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 they were good role models. So there's always been that uh, uh, mixed view. I give the floor back to you, Aaron. Thank you. <laughs> no, this is this is great. You know, I I don't have much to add. I I think it's important for folks to to understand, right? Uh, people approach like black Jewish relationships with such simplicity, right? And and uh, 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 Clarence is not doing that, and uh, neither are you, Nadine, and and neither am I. It's not the goal here. We're not we're not here to say, oh. Uh, we're going to validate uh, everyone's feelings on here. This is this is super complex, and it's full with myths, right? There are probably lots of people, and I love all 277 of you or 377 of you who are with us today, but some of you are sitting there thinking, what about the Black Jewish relationship? Like you had some investment in that relationship. We pretend we all have actually done something to build that relationship. But the truth is that it's been a very small percentage of the Jewish community and the black community who have invested in that relationships over decades. And then the rest of us, right, take advantage of it when it's working well, right, and say, this is us. How can you be spreading racism or anti-Semitism? Look at this relationship we've all built, right? That's the myth, right? Or when things are bad, we say, well, but what happened to this amazing relationship? It's often approached one-sided as well, right? This idea that Jews are white and somehow super privileged in our society and don't face their own forms of discrimination, which simply isn't true. And on the other hand, some in the Jewish community think that they have done much more for the Black community than they actually have done, right, for themselves uh, uh, as, as individuals. Look, to be clear, the civil rights movement also delivered policy change for the Jewish community that, that dismantled anti-Semitism, right? It was anti-Semitism and immigrant and refugee policies in this country that prevented Jews from fleeing the anti-Semitic pogroms, right, that occurred in Europe right, pre-1920 and then during the rise of Nazi Europe. It is Black folks, right, and that coalition with Jewish and Irish Catholics, because I'm not leaving them out now, right, who shifted that policy in this country. So I'm here to bring a complex and, you know, a complexity. When I think about the, the, the nation of Islam, when I think about Chicago, I suspect that there were two formations that were growing, right? There was the, the civil rights legacy, and then there was this version of black solidarity, which was probably much more complex than even uh, uh, I understand it. Folks may look at the nation of Islam and, and you know, uh, folks know I carry my critiques and strong critiques, but people may look at it and say, how did this happen in the black community? How did, was it allowed in the Black community? As if there was some alternative, right? As if somehow the Black community was getting the same resources from state and local governments, right, that the rest of Chicago was getting. That's simply not true. As if we were getting the same police protection. We weren't getting police protection. It was a war on the Black community. It was non-responsiveness. If you want to know how non-responsive the Black uh, uh, law enforcement was to the Black community, read articles today about the non-responsiveness of law enforcement around the country and all the myriad of excuses, right? And it's not just Black folks that they're not responding to now, right? It's, it's larger American society cannot get a response uh, from law enforcement. 
That has been the case in the Black community. And in those vacuums, things will always step in, right, and insert their leadership. And that is not unique to the Black community. And so I find, like, this, re this relationship around the, the Nation of Islam to be very, very interesting. And, uh, 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 but what Clarence said, but I'm, I'm going to move to something, because Clarence said something that really intrigued uh, uh, uh uh, my brain for a second. No, about Clarence, time. What is, what are the lessons, right, of, of understanding kind of populist leaders, right, who are engaging in conspiratorial thinking, right, and their impact on, on society? How should we be approaching that as leaders, as, as thinkers? How are we to understand them? What are some of the do's and don'ts that you've picked up along the way? Well, we could talk all day about that too, but I uh, was at a co conference. I just came back from a conference of journalists in New York. One of, one of the topics we were talking about was uh, how do you deal with the paranoid style of American politics as uh, that uh, a famous classic uh, essay uh, from, from the early 60s uh, talks about. Uh, and uh, Shankar Vedantam, who many will know from NPR and uh, from, uh, where's Shankar now? He's over at the... Uh, on the uh, web or something there, but anyway, he uh, uh, he, he, he he had the, the Hidden Brain podcast and all this, and one one show he did was about how do you, you know what do you do when your son comes home and he's talking QAnon stuff, <laughs> or, or or your your best friend has gone off the deep end on this. And or by ISIS the way, I've got a, yeah. I'm sorry, or ISIS that? stuff, or ISIS stuff. There's all sorts of yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and uh, I've, I've got a son who comes home talking QAnon stuff, and uh, I can uh, I have a hard time telling if, if he's really starting to believe this or if, he, if he's just saying it to get my goat, which, you know, young people are obliged to do all the time. But Shankar says, don't tell whoever it is. Don't tell them, oh, oh, oh you're full of blah, blah. Uh, no, say, oh, where did you hear that? And, and then lead the conversation in that direction. Find out what they have heard and uh, what they do believe in. Because uh, then you begin to win a certain level of trust. They know you're not just going to put them down. And, and then, then they'll, they'll keep their ears open while you talk to them. But usually the reflex, of course, is to um, uh, chew, chew, chew them out or, or tell them what fools they are and blah, blah, blah. I, I think um, I found myself doing this with people of all shapes and sizes and colors over the years and, and uh, more so these days. And as Eric uh, 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 mentioned, it's all part of the paranoid style of populist politics. And, and this is nothing new. Uh, it was something that George Wallace did it when he campaigned back in the 60s. Uh, you, could, you, you could read um, the, um, uh, oh, what the, um, uh, that, uh, um, uh, I, I, I'm just blanking on, on, on this wonderful political novel, uh, uh, Southern uh, political novel uh, about uh, this, this, this boss hog of a Louisiana. Paula King's Men. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> it's only my favorite political novel. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, that's, that's what um, uh, the, the, the classic populism, uh, they uh, want to reach the people who are alienated and down out and, and, and displaced and, and give them somebody to blame their troubles on and, and to tell them, uh, you know, give them a simple explanation for a, a very complicated world. This is, this is not new. It's just that now we do have the Internet that just magnifies the message and the impact that it has on people. And uh, that's why overseas, what's called the Great Replacement Theory, which I was reading about in European politics five years ago, now it's firmly implanted in American politics and on Fox News almost every night. Uh, and that is uh, something that disturbs me, And but I, I, I grit my teeth and I don't tell anybody I run into who believes this, uh, that, that you're a fool or you're a racist, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's what the the um, demagogues want you to do. Instead, I say, where did you hear that? Where did you get that idea? Why do you believe that? How many people do you think are being born every day in America? Well, let me ask you something here. Um, you know, what can people, what can we all hear today? What can we do? I, I, I hear that we can, when we have a child, a kid or a friend who comes to us, we should ask them questions as opposed to automatically judge them. But what else can we do? Well, how do we build trust? And also, how do we tell the story to the next generation? 
to the next generations? I think we have to make sure, uh, make sure we've got the story straight and pass it on in that way, giving them a, a, a foundation uh, to work with as to whether they believe it or not. Uh, at least you know where they're getting this belief from and what kind of rationality or irrationality it's based on. Uh, and uh, then you can do something with it. I, I think I've talked my son out of a couple of different paranoid theories he's brought home, but he always finds more because he's always. Two I know, but Sorry. he also has two amazing parents who are, who are there to to do that. Which oh, is, thank you, you so know, much. Just say and, but the thing is, is that well, what can we? What can all of us do? Should we? You know, are there other suggestions for what we can take away today from this conversation? I mean, one obviously is. <clears throat> Being, acknowledging the complexity of, of the relationship and complexity of humans and why we believe can, pe some people are so vulnerable to conspiracy theories, um, how to deal with them. Is there, are there other things that, that you, you, you think about? As Shelby Steele says, who I don't agree with all the time politically, but, but he once said, we, we can't let the few things about us that are different get in the way of the many things we have in common. And that's a nice, sweet old homily, but it is so damn true. I mean, way, how do you yeah. get, how do how do we get along on the, on the McLaughlin group for thirty years? <laughs> you know, and people all the time uh, uh, say say, how can you stand that John McLaughlin and that Pat Buchanan? My God! And, and I say, well, you know, two reasons: fame, fame, and fortune. Uh, but beyond that, though, uh, I uh, try to try to make make this a long story really short. You know, uh, when John McLaughlin died, and uh, at his funeral, you know how you find out about your friends really uh, when when their friends are, are are giving speeches at at the, the mass, and one of John's oldest friends uh, told about how he first described this idea for a talk show that he had, and it was simply he said think about a group of four or five friends who get together every Sunday afternoon at a sidewalk cafe. Uh, sip some drinks and talk about politics and start arguing and, and getting some really fussy matches and all. Uh, but then after a couple of hours or, or so, uh, they all, they all um, uh, pay the tab and, and uh, with a smile, get up, shake hands and say, see you next week. And <laughs> that's, that's the concept. And, 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 and that was what I think is so attractive about that show. And why people uh, still email me saying, uh, 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 what, what happened that show? Where, where are you guys going? And uh, excuse me, hold on. I, I just, my battery just ran down. Uh, I, I'm still here. Okay, I'm you keep talking. My I other power don't supply. worry about it. Don't worry about it. Anyway, you got an idea of the story. <laughs> no, but, but it's that, such an important point. It's a really important point. We have to build trust with other people and listen to those people. We may not agree with them, but we got to understand them and we we got to listen to the nuance we got to dig deep that's right that's yeah. right and quit go ahead eric you say something but no no i think we have to keep the conversation we have to keep unthreading this you know we we have to keep opening it up and you know it's about opening space for the next generation right who is trying yes. to figure this out they're going to make mistakes they're going to stumble i was just saying this to someone asked the question, how do we educate uh, uh, the youth? And I don't think it's our job to, to educate the youth. The youth will have to grapple with this question. Our role really, uh, I believe, right, is to open up the space, to, to provide the resources, right, and their defense for when they stumble and fall around these issues. If we shut them down uh, as they try to practice what it means to build this type of coalition, they'll never get there. We have to be patient. But one of the things we can do as older adults uh, is to continue to remember these stories, right? Remember this history and remember how complicated it really is. Yes. Right. I was just going to say that that story, the uh, reason why I brought that up is because we don't have shows like the McLaughlin Group. And, and by that, I mean, these days, every point of view has a different channel. Whereas uh, on that show, we were came from the left and from the right, and we all sat at the same table, and we all hashed it out, and we left as friends. And TV doesn't do that now. <laughs> TV says we got to have our uh, have you, you either got to be Tucker Carlson or Rachel Maddow, uh, uh, as if there's no in between. But in the real world, most people are in between. 
Well, we do try to do that at moment. Uh, very yes, much, that's very much what we're trying to do here is have some of these conversations on our pages and, and, and in print and on online, it's a little easier, you know, than doing it. Some of these, we're not on TV, um, but I think it gives us a little distance to be able to do that in a better way. And also through these conversations, because we don't all agree when we have these conversations. Right. That's important. We're going to, if we're going to, to build bridges of understanding at, at all, you've got to be able to sit down with people you don't agree with. <laughs> There's so many other questions, first of all, that are in the, so many, there's, there's 27 good questions that have accumulated. And of course, I only got to, you know, five of my 25 questions for, for Clarence. So I think we're Guilty. going to have to have you back um, I love so it. I can ask you the other questions. And, and then Eric has more questions too. Um, Suzanne, um, well, first of all, is would any of you, either of you like to say anything first? Or should we have Suzanne give us some questions from the oh, audience? please do. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for that conversation. Um, someone asked, I think, a really good question. Could you talk about solidarity rather than allyship? And what does it take to build a conversation of shared fate? Uh, I'm sorry, shared faith? Fate. Oh, fate. Fate. Ah. That's an interesting it's, term. Yeah. It's interesting. Is that what the young people call it these days? Because <laughs> uh, we really, uh, uh, no, I, I think that's a, uh, a very good uh, question. I believe the reason why Blacks and Jews in the anecdotal uh, moments that we just, examples that we have mentioned, why they came together because, because they had a sense of shared faith uh, because uh, the kind of uh, ostracism, social ostracism or uh, the kind of, of uh, paranoid oppression that, that they were going through was so similar, they decided to work together. Uh, that's why Jews were the last ethnic, white ethnics to leave Chicago for the suburbs because they were discriminated against much like we were uh, uh, in, in the uh, uh, days of heavy redlining, which is not really entirely over yet, but nevertheless, uh, I think a lot of the, well, I'm often asked why don't we see more black Jewish coalitions now? And I think part of it is because we don't have that sense of emergency that we did have earlier in the civil rights era uh, or later on in, in political empowerment era when coalitions were built around Jesse Jackson and uh, Barack Obama. But I, I see it coming because um, being forced out of my uh, usual cockeyed optimism uh, to realize that we do have peril on the horizon uh, in this country right now. I mean, look at the uh, January 6th committee meeting this evening. I think we're going to have some more examples of this. Uh, democracy itself is on, on precipice. I wasn't expecting this. And it all comes from a lot of people out there who feel displaced, who feel like the system isn't listening to them, uh, that um, uh, they are, are somehow being cheated or, or, or being displaced or replaced. And we need to work to reverse those messages that people are receiving out there. And if we, if we don't, or if we promise them something that's not true, and then it turns out that it is uh, true, or the, uh, the, what the what they're afraid of, uh, uh, like back in my hometown, or it's, I was like I say, J.D. Vance's hometown, unfortunately, uh, dear, dear J.D. is going over to, to the dark side. Uh, and um, it, uh, we used to talk about how uh, working class white folks and working class black folks need to work together on their mutual problems, because the bigger problem than uh, race, as I see it, is class. And my hometown had upward mobility for everybody who had a job uh, back when I was growing up. But now when J.D. Vance was growing up, it doesn't. And a lot of those young fellows are the ones who you see out there uh, joining these militia groups, and et cetera, et cetera. And that is, uh, th that, that is just downright sinful for this country. This is the land of opportunity. Uh, are, are those just empty words or are we going to work on trying to bring back the opportunity that I had, the, the son of a janitor and a cook, those opportunities that, that, that I had to make it up into the middle class. Uh, we need to really focus ourselves. That's one of my sermons. And, and Eric, do you want to talk a little bit about, uh, is there a difference between allyship and solidarity? I think, um, Allyship, uh, 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 there, neither are terms that I actually use much. Allyship 
uh, or solidarity. They, they, mainly, they, they denote this idea that you have no self-interest, right, uh, uh, in the outcome, right, of uh, equity and the conversation around opportunity and prosperity in America. Look, all of us stand to win. When the Black Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s succeeded, America succeeded, and so did everyone in it. I often point out that one of the unique things about Black civil rights struggles in this country is that uh, it tends to be an, ex an inclusive, right? Uh, uh, meaning the benefits of Black struggle in this country tend to benefit all Americans. And because of the uh, consistency of, of race in America, often benefit other communities more than the Black community itself when all is said and done. So when I talk about solidarity and allyship, mainly what I think younger people mean is understanding that there is common self-interest, right, in a strong society grounded in, in equity. And I think people pull back, uh, push back on the idea that we're showing up to help another community. When I speak out against anti-Semitism, right, I'm not showing up to be nice to the Jewish community. I am merely expressing, right, that anti-Semitism has an impact on all of our lives in significantly negative ways. And it's important for all of us for that reason alone uh, to push back against anti-Semitism. I think that's what young people, I'm, look, I, I'm not a young person. I just play one on TV. But I would just <laughs> say, right, to, to project uh, 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 for young people, I would interpret that's how I understand what they mean when they utilize some of these terms. And there's this polarization that, so one of the things that I know we've all talked about is that the black Jewish relationship is a very important component of democracy. Yes. And because yes. it has created change in positive ways. Um, it hasn't always functioned well, it, always, it hasn't always been perfect. And there's lots of tensions, but it has been um, that, it's not just like the Democratic Party, but really Blacks and Jews together and other minorities have shaped, have had a huge influence on how democracy has grown in this country. And so I feel like it's really been hurt by some of the polarization. There's polarization. We are living in an era where it's almost, you can get polarized about everything. You know, yeah. the, you know, Black community is polarized. The Jewish community is polarized. The, you know, all the communities are polarized. And one of, the, one of the things we really have to think about is how we can transcend that. Uh, because this is such an important alliance, an amorphous alliance, an alliance that exists in some streams. That's one reason we call this the Wide River Project. Because, you know, in some areas, it's not a strong alliance. In other areas, it is. There's just so many different, there's so many channels that, but we need to build those channels to be stronger. And we have and the polarization is 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 a really important thing for us to be fighting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nowadays we're polarized inside of each party, <laughs> not just the two parties, but inside of each party they're polarized. Well, and this is beyond the, the party. This is a this is really important. This is not just the change doesn't occur. Political parties, by the way, don't just are not the are not the catalyst to change. Political parties are. This country wasn't invented for political parties. There were not right. supposed to be political parties. Political parties are very short-term focused. Let's get the next person elected and the next person elected. It's not where the, the kind of, a lot of the intellectual growth comes from and the movements come from. And I think we have to stop relying on parties as where, you know, as, as oh, the party, if the party, only the party was better, it would be able to, the country would be better. If only whatever party we believe in was stronger, the country would be better. It's not, that's not how it works. It's the country, the infrastructure of the country, the institutions in the country, the, the, the groups that come together in the country influence what parties do. That's true. Yeah, yeah. And, and quite a few people have, have brought up the topic or the question of maybe more of an acknowledgement of um, how do we deal with anti-Semitism that comes from the black community and how do we deal with racism that comes from the Jewish community um, and, and not to be fooled that it's not there in both communities. Oh yeah, 
you know, uh, this gets back to what I was saying earlier about taking the other party for granted. Uh, you know, when you think you know all there is to know about the other party, then uh, that in itself is is a racist concept that that uh, I uh, I have all all of my tropes lined up in the right place, so I know what uh, black people want or I know what Jewish people want. Uh, that is uh, a, a real cheapening of of the uh, individual worth of people. That above all else, wh whether you love somebody or hate somebody, before any of that, you have to have some sense of the worth of this person. And if you don't, uh, uh, you know, well, ha having a prejudice that says, well, I know all I need to know, that's about the most cheapening thing you could say about somebody. And I've seen that happen with black folks and white folks. Yeah, I know what they really want. They're just blah, blah, blah. And that uh, is uh, something that, that still happens. And it's, um, uh, that's why I'm not, uh, I'm not the Pollyanna I used to be. I'm not, I'm not the cockeyed optimist I used to be. I still believe in the long run, uh, uh, human beings can, can figure this out and that democracy can work. But as George H.W. Uh, Bush said, uh, in the long run, we're all dead. And uh, uh, it's in the short run where we have these problems. It wasn't H.W., it was George W. Bush who said that. Uh, and uh, th 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 this, this is, a, is a very true in itself. So I think that um, when I... I uh, look at the uh, situation now where uh, we're sitting here talking about black Jewish relations. And this is the first discussion of the sort I've had in a long time. Whereas back in the 80s, the mid 80s, I was almost every week somebody was having a discussion about, about black Jewish relations because at that time Jesse Jackson was running, Louis Farrakhan was there in the uh, uh, just off stage, and uh, uh, our whole political system is kind of roiling around these kind of uh, group relations. Um, that is as cooled off. Uh, then there's the Barack Obama campaign. And uh, again, there were tensions between groups. Uh, now we got tensions between groups uh, coming from the right. And I like to think this is going to, going to um, blow over too if we don't blow ourselves up first. But in any case, it, these things don't go away. Uh, what does go away is interest where we think that, oh, well, this isn't that important anymore. Why are you bringing that up? And that's when they sneak up on you. That was so beautifully said, by the way. I want to say, Thank you. really, you caught something really important. And it's also not just in interpersonal relationships. It's not just between Blacks and Jews, but it's about liberals and conservatives in this country. Um, yep. If I hear any other liberals say, I already know everything that all the conservatives think. And conservatives tell me they know everything liberals think. We don't. That's right. <laughs> there's so much we don't know about each other. And there's so much nuance. And we may disagree on a great deal, but we do not. And that ends the possibility. When that kind of conversation, that kind of assumption, ends the possibility of us, of a strong democracy. Because it's then just a battle between two forces. And what creates change in the end is the transcendence is that people, enough pe people transcend their position on the liberal side and their position on the conservative side or their position as blacks, their position as Jews, to be able to come together and create some kind of positive change or meaningful, move the world meaningfully forward, or at least address some, you know, some crisis. And we have to be able to do that. And so this conversation, so what you're saying is, is so usually important to everything that we do. Uh, what, is the, doing it. what is the single most important idea about the American Black community that you feel the American Jewish community has the hardest time hearing and affirming? Because that's where we should start. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Uh, the single thing, huh? The, the, the single, the one thing. Everybody I mean, I think people, people are, black man. You guys might have different points of view on this, by right, the way. But, but I also think people are really looking to walk away with some kind of a concrete thing that they can do in their community. Yeah. Well, first, let's hear that first question. I really yeah. want to hear the answer to that. So, so here, here's the, the, the one thing. Uh, and uh, I'll say this about the, the, the Black community, but I actually think this is one of the key functions of really establishing folks who are interested in building black and Jewish relationships, right? Uh, within those communities. So I'm using plural, I, I saw that. Um, 
the first thing to understand is that we can be both, all of us, right? Black and Jewish can be both the perpetrators of bigotry at the same time that we are on the receiving end of bigotry. Meaning one can promote anti-Semitism and be a victim of racism at the same time. And one can promote racism and be the victim of anti-Semitism at the same time. And the moment that we as leaders finally can hold that contradiction, right, that seemingly contradiction, we will have made great strides in rebuilding a 21st century Black Jewish coalition in this country. That would be my one thing. That's, that's great. That. Yeah. How about you, Clarence? Well, a lot of truth to that. I, I always have a hard time with magic pill answers because <laughs> this is what people usually want when they say, what's the thing I can go out to do today and, and all. And I can think about a bunch of things people can do. Uh, for, for one thing, you're already doing it just by watching this program, ladies and gentlemen, just by caring enough to uh, 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 engage in this uh, program, uh, this discussion, and we have the electronic ability to, uh, uh, to to send in questions that aren't just trolling, but are actually trying to find some answers. Uh, and and uh, that's good. I think um, uh, I, I would like to say, well, if you listen to what I've just said, <laughs> you've got the formula right there. Uh, it's not that easy, but I think the, the very fact that, that people don't just say, uh, well, that, that, that was last year's problem. We don't need to worry about that now. Wrong. That's when you find, and I've done this. You know, I, I, I really uh, thought after uh, Barack Obama's election, I knew it wasn't going to be, be utopia now. But at least I said, it's going to be a big step forward for black folks and white folks and everybody else to understand each other. And it just uh, it wasn't as big of a jump as I thought, quite the opposite. Uh, it was also a big opportunity for certain demagogues to uh, go and play the fear card and push people farther apart and making the, the uh, problem more complicated. But I don't think it's that much more complicated. I think that, that, the, that the folks would just look at the basic fundamental, uh, um, uh, the, the basic fundamental uh, positive aspects of each other uh, and um, realize that that's too valuable for us to just trash uh, uh, then we, we are already, already taking one step toward our society's recovery. I just want to do it before the world blows up. <laughs> um, I, I do want to acknowledge and we're not going to be able to finish all of these questions and I know there are also questions in here um, on a lot of different topics that we would plan to get to throughout the rest of the year. Um, so know that we have other topics uh, for programs coming down the line. But I do want to note, I know that several people have, have mentioned um, that to remind everybody that the Jewish community is not just a white Jewish community, that there are um, Jews of color. And specifically, somebody asked, as a Black Jew, what is their something, what's their role in helping um, bring together Black Jewish relations? And what kind of Black Jew? <laughs> are you talking about a Black American Jew or a Black Middle Eastern Jew, uh, Ethiopian Jew? I mean, there's diversity on top of diversity. That's the world. And That's not do... an answer, not an observation. I just want to say that Moment's written about this too, and we have a really well-written piece which explores like, you know, some of this, uh, which we can share with everybody later as well that goes into it. Go ahead, Eric. So one thing I, I, I wrote, and I hope it didn't come across as flippant because I, I did, I meant it um, uh, very seriously. One of the things to realize is this is never a conversation that is going to be concluded, right? The relationship between Blacks and Jews. Uh, uh, it is going to be unfolding, uh, uh, and every generation, uh, hopefully, will have the opportunity to, to struggle with this. So one of the things I would say to Jews of color, but particularly Black Jews, is do not let your communities eat you up over this, right? It's quite attractive to look at Black Jews and to say, they are the bridge, right? Let's, uh, uh, let's use them. But bridges get walked on, right? And uh, we need you more than uh, for just bridges. We need you for your voices, for your creativity, for your leadership, for all the wonderful things and gifts you will bring into this world. So my argument is do not be used as, as a bridge. Make us all do our work. Speak your truth. 
and understand, right, that we honor when you do speak to this issue. And our job is to listen intently when you do. And I want to say that the Jewish community, as a part of the Jewish community, have made huge steps. And it's just changed so dramatically from, you know, Black Jews and Jews of color just being hidden. I mean, not so much like physically hidden, but they just didn't, they were invisible. And um, to really being embraced by the Jewish, the larger Jewish community and being honored. So I do think that there's what's one of those areas. And, you know, there have been some major areas where we have seen incredible cultural and social growth. And, and, and that, that, that has been one of them. That's right. That thank perfect. you so much. Yeah, not yeah, that it's perfect, so as Eric says, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for bringing that up. And uh, er Eric, too, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of Zora Neale Hurston had this wonderful little essay about uh, how everybody wants to oversimplify the Negro. And I wish I'd memorized the whole essay, it's a long paragraph, but it, it's basically about how uh, people uh, are used to seeing us a certain way. And when, when we aren't that way, they can't believe it or they, they can't reckon it or, or they begin to question whether you're a Negro or not. And, uh, and uh, you know, why are you behaving in a way I, believe it, I don't understand? Well, people are, are complicated, but we're, we're kind of in that situation today uh, where we, we want to oversimplify each other and uh, the world's more complicated. And, and I say that the, the, the question about black Jews came up because this comes up among, among me and my black friends. This question will, will come up, you know, well, who do they think they are? And I said, they think they are what they are. Uh, uh, like the rest of us, the, the, the uh, products of their, their background. And we all, uh, diversity is not just a question of, uh, of a race. It's also uh, communities and it's ethnic backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. But I find it to be really fascinating and wonderful. There's some people who are really open to diversity as being a wonderful thing and, and, and illuminating for all of us and broadening. There are others who are just thoroughly intimidated by it. So I've got to deal with both of them. So I, I just want to say that the, you know, one of the things that's happened, the change in the world, one of the changes in the world is this, ex, this, ex, this um, acceptance or even enjoyment of the diversity of people. So like the Jewish community is so incredibly diverse. One could never just say a Jewish community. There are hundreds, thousands of Jewish communities. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, maybe every person is, a, is their own unique Jewish community and maybe every single, you know, but there's, and the same in the African-American world. And I think one of the things that we do when we were discussing black Jewish relationships is that we oversimplify, we're identifying, we have some particular idea of what the community is in our mind. We have some teacher or we remember the SNCC incident or we remember this, and that's all we focus on. And the point of this conversation or the, the bigger arc of this whole Wide River Project is to remember that there's this breadth of, of, of Blacks in America and, and breadth of Jews in America. And there are different, different links between all of us, different channels between all of us. Um, there's the right, there's the left, there's the religious right, there's the middle religious right, you know, there's... I mean, there's just so many, <laughs> there's yeah. just so well, much. So, yes. That was why I, I put uh, Norman Podhoritz's essay on, on the list, you know, we didn't get to that one, but. Uh, well, you know, I'll ask you two questions. I'd like to ask you two questions if it's okay with, with um, that, that we didn't get to on the list. And one, what, tell us a little bit about the 1963 essay titled My Negro Problem and Ours by Norman Podhoritz, who was the editor, editor of Commentary. Um, tell us a well, little bit about the impact of that. And then I've got one more question that was on your list that I want to ask you too. Yeah, uh, that is, is, is a good example to, to, to uh, maybe oversimplify it, but a really good example of uh, uh, Jewish backlash, you could say, uh, back at, uh, uh, by a, a well-known conservative, although he's, uh, he's known as a, a founder of the neoconservative movement, uh, 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 people uh, like uh, uh, him and... Uh, uh, a number of others who were lefties back in the 30s or 40s, and they became um, conservative uh, or more conservative later on. And uh, um, Bill Crystal, uh, his father Irving Crystal, also well, well, known, of course, and their mothers the, and their wives too, and their, Richard Hill yes, Park, very smart also, women. Yeah, both very, and um, yeah. Midge Decker. Yeah, and that much, it's not yeah. really clear that the, how left they ever were, but at least they you know, hung out <laughs> with the lefties at City College or wherever they were at. 
So. Yeah, it's a different generation and a yeah. different city. You know, uh, New York is big enough that you actually can find Jewish conservatives without having <laughs> looking too hard. I, I, one of my one of my uh, uh, most wonderful memories of the '80s was a uh, a fan n note I got from from uh, uh, Mayor Ed Koch uh, because the the Jewish Daily Forward had done an article on on black folks trying to bridge uh, uh, with, with Jews. And um, Ed Koch uh, had read it, and he sent me. I uh, know he, he seems to write notes to everybody all over the place. And, and I said, you know, Ed Koch and I don't agree with everything on, in politics, but he, he's basically a nice guy. You know, I mean, I can see that nice guy part inside of him. Uh, more of us need to, to do that, I think. But anyway, uh, Pot Horse's essay, which I've, I've already uh, stalled too long. Uh, it is. Um, it's interesting. A, a, a lot of it bothers me. A lot of it bothers a lot of people because he he spends a lot of time. Uh, talking about growing up uh, as as a uh, Jewish kid in a New York neighborhood where he was um, uh, 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 surrounded by anti-Semites of various types, including black folks, how there were blacks who were better off than he and his family were, uh, and, and he was uh, feeling uh, or, 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 or being uh, uh, ostracized by them uh, or, or getting in fights with, with the kids on the street. And that, um, uh, in other words, it was like, uh, no, in reading it, it was like um, saying, hey, I I'm a victim too, you know, <laughs> respect my victimhood, et cetera, et cetera. He, he mellows out later on in the essay uh, and um, uh, acknowledges that, that th this is the point of view of like a six or seven year old boy uh, of one block whose whole world is like one neighborhood block. And, and, and I, I, can, I grew up in that kind of neighborhood too. And, uh, but you learn after a while that there's a lot more of the world than that one block. Uh, but at the same time, though, he, uh, he he's rather unsparing in his critique of uh, people who are too sanguine about uh, the uh, uh, b black victimhood and uh, uh, how, uh, well, a a as if Jews are having so uh, well off now that they don't have to worry about being beat up on the street or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm uh, not doing it, it uh, total justice, but... Uh, it was it, it raised a fuss in, in uh, intellectual circles back in those days. Uh, James Baldwin and various others uh, just uh, um, uh, one essay after another. I, I first uh, read uh, all, all of this back in college, uh, half century ago, uh, but uh, it still speaks to this current era. Uh, and in fact, the language, if anything, is more candid than what we usually get. <laughs> These days, uh, these days of political correctness, uh, et cetera. But uh, did you read it? How'd you feel about it? I was like a little kid. I mean, it's been, you know, I never, I, I didn't, I, I mean, read it later. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, I mean, and I, I, I we've interviewed Norman Podhortz, and um, I, so I, you know, to me, like it was something that was not at all anything in my personal experience. Mm -hmm. So of growing up, it, it was meaningless. It, it didn't really, it's, it's only meaningful to me in a historical sense to have read it. Um, right, it didn't right. have any impact on my life. I wasn't paying attention. I, I, I barely read, I did not maybe know how to even, I wasn't even reading yet, you know. <laughs> so I, I, think, um, I think that's who cares about it now, nowadays, so, which is why I brought it up. We were talking about Black Jewish relations and, you know, before the current era, uh, what it was like. And, and that was certainly a, a little slice of, of, the, of the 50s. No but it was Mailer hugely influential. It was usually yes. influential. And it was, you know, part of the whole breakup between, you know, blacks and Jews in certain areas and some one stream. Um, mm -hmm. But I know that there were, I have friends who were, you know, adults at the time who lived in New York who were just horrified by it. Right. And, you know, and they were horrified. Now, remember, Commentary was actually not a, not a conservative publication. This was right. sort of the beginning of Commentary becoming you know, moving, moving to a whole new direction. It was founded um, by American Jewish Someone Canadian. just wrote yes. that um, he, he did not identify as a conservative at, right. at the time that- No, he didn't. That he wrote the piece. What year again? Tell me again the year. I was- 63. I mean, so I didn't, then yeah. James Baldwin's essay, uh, um, I, and now I'm spacing on the title, but I think it's Blacks Are Not Anti-Semitic. Uh, 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 yeah, um, they're anti white, I think, I'm because they're anti white answer. is in 60 is in 67. Yeah. So it, it sounds like there was this this kind of debate. I, I, um, 
I read Stephen I've Bob read, mentions Baldwin in, in, in this essay and, and a, a, a piece of Baldwin wrote for the New York Times. So those of you who, who Google it up, folks, it's worth reading. <laughs> so it's a really important because one of the things we didn't get to talk to is that there was this huge intellectual rift that occurred in the 1960s. And I mean, it was probably occurring earlier, but that that piece was part of that intellectual rift. And so there's, you know, we didn't really get to talk about some of the other tensions, like there have been riots, there was Crown Heights, but there were also like these intellectual riots, one could say. That's right. What were you saying, yeah. Eric? What were you saying, Eric, though? No, no, that I'm I'm just um it's fascinating. There, you know, there are these tensions happening. That's that's the other piece, right? That's the other conflation. We look at the tensions between, there was also tension between the Black and Jewish community at that same time, right, that Black and Jewish civil rights organizations, right, and are, are gathering, right, or advancing. There's also tension. Uh, um, uh, and a lot of it, I think, uh, Clarence has, has uh, written about, right, over time. A lot of that was class-based. Some of that had to do with immigrant status, right? This was the immigration status, new immigrants uh, who are of Ashkenazi descent, right? New immigrants are always placed adjacent to the Black community, right? There's always tension between the new immigrants, right, and the Black community, which they eventually step over, right, on their way up the American food chain uh, uh, of assimilation. So there were these different tensions playing out around class. And then the Black Civil Rights Movement comes north. And when it comes north, it moves from this idea of aspiration, right, to the challenge of real challenge of, of systemic institutional policy change. And that's where things get very messy with the Black Jewish coalition, right? It moves from this idea of belonging to how do we address systemic inequality and that became the hard conversation adding to that tension up north, I believe. And I think there's the fear of crime and urban crime. Yes. And then there's the fear of the Black Panthers. So I think you can't read Norman Podhoritz's, you know, essay without Fair. keeping that in mind, because this is part of this is part of the, you know, instability of the late 60s. Um, Although he was responding Pod to Horst was the Black Horse was in the early sixties. Yeah. Black Panthers came along in, in in the late. In fact, in the early sixties, the Black Panthers were were the, were the Lowndes County Black Panthers in the South who were registering people to vote. You know, Stanley uh, Carmichael and those folks. And it, it was in, in Oakland they became a militant. Uh, you're right, absolutely. I have my years wrong, but I That's think he's right. responding. But I think he's responding to some of this. The, you know, cons he's con this is one of the things that drives him to be conservative. He's you know, he's concerned about the chaos, the instability. Um, I, we have to, we, you know, we have gone over time because it's been so amazing just to talk. We yeah. can continue this conversation another time uh, with so. the many questions that are in the chat that we didn't get to and the many other questions we had that we didn't have, that, that Clarence and I discussed earlier. And, but I just want to thank all of you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Clarence and Eric for being, so wonderful to have a have such a wonderful conversation with and just to be with you guys is just um, a pleasure and Suzanne mm -hmm. and all of you who 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 came today and who are watching us this program in the future um, it's really been very special um, I want to thank you too and my uh, uh, ed editor uh, well I want to thank my editor because I'm going to be late with my deadline again because of this program but I just blame me. It Just it's it. my fault. It's my fault. Yeah, I think it was worth it. Yeah. <laughs> and thank Eric, you again. Look, Nadine, too, always a pleasure to see you. Clarence, you are welcome here anytime. Um, thank you. Uh, you can Zoom bomb uh, our discussions uh, uh, for the remainder of time. Uh, such you. a pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Moment Magazine, uh, always wonderful, always stimulating. Thank you so much. 
Bye, Keep everyone. Up the good work, well, wait, real, real, real right. quick, I know, real quick, I, again, thank you, Clarence, Eric, and Nadine. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will be sending out a follow-up email that will include uh, links to the recording, as well as a lot of the books and articles and um, other things that were mentioned here today. I want to remind everybody to go to momentmag.com, where you can register for next week's program about uh, the role of social media and the spreading of conspiracy theories. Again, thank you, everybody, and we will see everybody next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.